Chapter 4 Anya hadn't seen the video, but was filled in on the phone during her ride in from Virginia. She stood in the doorway of the IPFG financial branch and marveled over the sheer size of the area that had been contaminated due to the suspect's dramatic finale. The visual input of surveying the scene in person amalgamated with what she had seen in her mind's eye during the phone briefing. Several FBI techs were already swarming, taking photographs and jotting notes into pocket-sized notebooks. Before entering the building, Anya had donned a pair of rubber gloves and a pair of paper booties to both protect her shoes and limit contamination of the area. Moving around inside without disturbing the scene, Anya thought immediately upon entering, is going to be a trick. The ceremonial salvo splattered blood and tissue within a thirty-foot radius, covering runner carpets, plush chairs for waiting customers, neatly organized paperwork on two glass countertops, intended for filling out deposit and withdrawal slips, and just about everything else in her line of sight. Then there was the teller's area. Anya empathized with the crime scene techs who were tasked with processing, measuring, and documenting every inch of the chaotic scene. Hey, partner, glad you could make it, Andrew Harrison called out as he emerged from a door near the elevators. Harrison wasn't exactly Anya's partner. The three-agent bank robbery unit based out of the D.C. field office was organized so that each agent managed their own caseload, independent of the other two. Each of them would draw on the others for assistance when needed. However, Anya found herself turning to Harrison more often than her other colleague, Jim Lawson, she found Harrison, as tactless as he could be at times, to be more competent than Lawson, who surprisingly had the most seniority and experience of the three of them. Anya eased toward Harrison, trying to avoid disturbing anything. Hey, buddy, Anya said warmly. Is Lawson here yet? No, he's not coming. Still a training in Alabama. Oh, so it's just us. Where are we so far? Anya asked. Well, it's not just us. Wells is upstairs. But I can fill you in a bit on what we've found out so far, Harrison replied. Anya pursed her lips. Damn it. I was hoping to get a few minutes to sort this thing out before Wells showed up. Oliver Wells was the special agent in charge of the D.C. field office. Anya had a decent working relationship with him, enough so that he had approved her reassignment there. But he tended to be high-strung and Anya always felt this was added pressure that made it difficult to think critically and methodically, especially in the early stages of an investigation. This is some weird stuff, Harrison began. It took an hour and a half to evacuate the building because the bomb techs had to clear explosives from the entryways first. They thought it was C4, but it turned out to be freaking modeling clay. Harrison let out a quick, hearty laugh. Anya smirked less at the idea of the clever ruse and more at Harrison's amusement over it. These five, pointing to the center of the room where the five deceased suspects laid in a grotesque heap, kill every employee they come across, but let all of the customers go. What the hell is that? he asked rhetorically. They don't even ask or make any attempt to grab the money in the tills or the safe. Instead, they go and mess around with a computer upstairs and then, of course... They all off themselves, and all of this in full view of the cameras. Makes perfect sense to me, Harrison said with a shrug and a smile to match the facetious remark. Okay. So obviously, their whole goal was to get access to the computer room. But why kill the tellers? Anya was puzzled. Well, this gets weirder, much weirder. Once everyone was out, I debriefed a few of the employees who work in the IT department on the fourth floor. Most of them were useless. They had no idea what was going on down here. Anyway, I was talking to one of these geeky guys. Harrison flipped through his notebook. Stephen Reed, computer engineer. This guy said he got a look at our dead friends here when he was being evacuated by SWAT and recognized the masks these guys were wearing. Said he's positive the masks are a kind of calling card used by a group called the CEA, Cryptocurrency Evangelist Army. Harrison waited for a reaction, like he had just revealed the twist at the end of an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Anya's face remained expressionless. 
I'm not familiar, Anya said. Well, neither was I, but I didn't want to let that dweeb know, so I looked it up. Harrison referred back to his notepad. The CEA, more commonly known as the Evangelists, are a hacktivist group who support digital currency like Bitcoin. Basically, they pull stunts to draw attention to their cause, the goal being to replace traditional banking with this decentralized banking concept. Well, that could explain killing the bank employees and then releasing the customers. Some statements, like they're liberating the people from big finance or something. Were the three tellers the only employees in the branch? Anya asked. Yes. Well, no, actually. The manager was in his office over there. He locked himself in the closet. Lucky for him, no one went looking. We didn't even know he was in there until SWAT did the secondary search. There was also a loan officer who would normally be at the desk over there, but she ran next door for a bagel. By the time she came back, uniformed guys were already out front and stopped her from walking back in. So, do we know what they accessed? Anya pressed. No. This guy Reed said if he got to a computer, he could give us an idea of what these guys were up to. But the building was already locked down. Can you point him out to me? Anya asked. Yeah, come with me, Harrison said as he walked toward the rear exit door. Anya followed Harrison out into the parking lot. The Red Cross had already arrived and set up several tents. Family members of employees were arriving to join their loved ones, who were being held on sight until they could be thoroughly debriefed. What nonsense, Harrison said disapprovingly. Counselors, medics. Most of these people didn't even know anything was wrong until our guys made them leave the building. Well, aren't you just a bleeding heart, Anya teased. There, that's Reed right there, Harrison interrupted, ignoring Anya's jab. He pointed out a slight man wearing a white shirt and yellow tie. By his face, Anya guessed he was in his early thirties, but his full head of salt-and-pepper hair made her second-guess her estimate. She approached. Hello, Mr. Reed. I'm Agent Kohler with the FBI. May I ask you a couple of questions? Sure, no problem, Reed said. My partner tells me you recognize the masks the suspects were wearing. Of course. Everyone knows the evangelists. Don't you have YouTube? Yes, Anya said, awkwardly answering Reed's rhetorical question. She left it at that. Last year they launched a DDoS attack on us and about thirty other banks, Reed said. At least we believe it was them. Sorry, Anya interrupted. DDoS. It stands for Distributed Denial of Service, Reed explained. Basically, an attacker uses a bunch of computers to flood the resources of the target system. Once the available bandwidth and resources are overwhelmed with the malicious traffic, the system can no longer respond to legitimate requests. Essentially, it takes the whole service offline. This is particularly problematic, to say the least. Why is that? Anya wasn't necessarily interested in the technical details, but she had learned long ago that the longer she could keep a person talking— the more useful the information became. Everyone knows IPFG is one of the largest online banking providers in the world, but what most people don't realize is we are also contracted by dozens of others to provide their online banking infrastructure. When you navigate to your bank's online portal, it may be branded as such-and-such such bank, but in reality, it's our developers, engineers, and infrastructure behind it. We have dozens of state-of-the-art data centers located throughout the world, and we service literally tens of millions of customers. When the evangelists attacked us last year, we were hosting all but one of the banks they went after, Reed explained. Do they have some kind of vendetta against your company? Anya asked. Against the whole financial machine. Wall Street. Investment banks. All of it. They post all this stuff about how banks are greedy and cryptocurrency will free people from tyranny. So this so-called army is a bunch of terrorists who kill innocent people to prove a point, Harrison chimed in. I don't exactly follow them, Reed clarified, but I've never heard of the evangelists being violent. Usually they disrupt computer systems or maybe stage demonstrations, like when they spray-painted that bull statue on Wall Street painted the entire thing green. 
Looks like they've graduated from vandalism to mass murder and stealing God knows how many people's financial information, Anya said. Well, if that's what they were after, they came to the wrong place, Reed said matter-of-factly. What do you mean? Anya probed. I mean, if you wanted to steal the millions of financial identities we manage, you wouldn't want to come here. Even though we do physically house a lot of data here, it's mostly infrastructure stuff. This building is our main development office. Engineers, developers, front-end staff, back-end staff, database people, testing. But the actual customer data isn't stored here. It's encrypted and stored in various other highly secure facilities around the world. The network is segmented in such a way that you can't even access that stuff from here. We mostly work with mock-up data. We're innovating software solutions, building artificial intelligence. You know, all the fun stuff. My point is, the most they were going to be able to do is set us back a bit. Everything is backed up hourly off-site. Anya pulled out a notebook from her blazer pocket and jotted down a few ideas she intended to follow up on later. If you ask me, Reed continued, my guess is they weren't trying to take anything. They were here to add something. Our network security is top-notch. Nobody is getting access to our systems from the outside. If you wanted to infect our systems with a virus, the only way that makes sense would be to introduce it to the network from the inside. Anya looked at Harrison and realized that his eyes had glazed over at Reed's long-winded ramble. Probably within the first three seconds after Reed started talking, Anya sensed that Reed, his nerd bravado notwithstanding, could probably provide some much-needed clarification. Mr. Reed, if I can get you back upstairs, can you determine what the subjects were trying to access? Anya asked. Anya, Harrison interjected softly. He gave a gentle squeeze to her upper arm. Is this a good idea? These guys came here for something, Anya said. Everything was meticulously planned. The fake explosives, the simultaneous suicides. I don't believe for one second that they just hadn't realized there was nothing here to steal. Anya didn't wait for Harrison's approval. Mr. Reed, please come with me, she said, walking toward the building. Anya led Reed through the rear door of the branch. Harrison followed a few feet behind. Anya pressed the button to call the elevator. Waiting for the elevator to churn its way down to the ground level, Anya tapped her fingers on her thigh with one hand while she rubbed her temples with the thumb and middle finger of the other, a typical tell that her brain was working in overdrive. As the elevator opened, Reed began to move inside. Anya put out her arm, momentarily stopping him. She looked at Reed with determination. Mr. Reed, she said, you and I are going to find out what this was really about. The three entered the elevator and Anya pressed the round, backlit button labeled four. The doors closed, sealing out the commotion of the forensic investigation that ramped up into full swing. Chapter 5 Blake punched a code into the lock's keypad. The servo motor slid the bolt open with a sound that was reminiscent of a small robotic arm. The Bluetooth device communicated with the base station to disengage Blake's home alarm. He entered, relocked the door behind him, and reset the alarm for home mode, activating the door and window sensors while disabling the motion detectors. Even though he was sure he already locked the car, Blake depressed the lock button on his key fob and listened for the short blast of the Dodge Challenger's horn. He kicked off his sneakers, dropped his gym bag, and tossed his keys on a small table just inside the foyer of his three-story townhouse. He walked past the stairway to the kitchen, checked that the back door was secure, and peeked through the blinds into the garden, not expecting to see anything out of the ordinary. Blake did a casual check of the rooms and determined that nothing was out of place. The procedure was half-hearted, nowhere near thorough, and would be utterly pointless if someone had been lying in wait for him. He went through the motions not because he thought he was in danger, but because carrying out the pretense helped him relax. Over time, old habits, once necessary habits, solidified into superstitions, of which he had many. For as long as he could remember, he faithfully followed the rules of many common wives' tales, avoiding the underside of ladders, knocking on wood, 
despite the fact that he did not believe in the underlying cosmic retribution. Not really. In addition to the colloquial ones, Blake added several unique superstitions of his own, particularly when it came to missions. Satisfied with his less-than-thorough check of the house, Blake returned to the kitchen, opened the refrigerator, and surveyed its contents more thoroughly than he had the rest of the house. He selected a carton of orange juice, pulled a glass from the cupboard, and poured the juice until it reached the top of the glass. He shook the carton to gauge the weight of the sloshing liquid. This wouldn't be worth putting back. He drank from the carton, finishing the last of it. He picked up his smartphone from the inductive charger, allowed the face recognition software to unlock it, and swiped through the screen until he found the icon for the United Bank app. Blake normally enjoyed being able to leave his phone at home while running or going to the gym. His smartwatch was connected to the cellular network and allowed him to still receive calls, read texts, and listen to music. But with his bank cards malfunctioning, he wished he had taken his smartphone along this time. He touched the icon and allowed the online banking application to load while he took a long gulp of juice. Login failed. You've got to be kidding me. Is the whole damn thing down? Blake manually keyed in his username and password. Login failed, the screen complained. He searched for the United Bank customer service number, touched to accept the auto dial, turned on the speaker mode, and left the phone on the island counter. After navigating a series of voice prompts, Blake was treated to a nondescript performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. He finished his juice and waited, tapping his fingers in syncopated rhythm. Come on, pick up the phone. Blake's mind wandered. He thought about the last time he had seen Anya, about the guilt he had for pushing her away, about how he wanted to tell her he did it for her safety, for her well-being. He replayed how, when he saw her in the gym, he yearned to tell her he really did love her, that he had always loved her, that he always would. Oh, yeah. That would have gone over well. Hey, Joe, how have you been? It's been a while. By the way, you were the love of my life, and I pushed you away because I was a clandestine operative putting you in danger simply for being associated with me. Oh, and I had no choice but to lie to you on a daily basis. Cheers. Blake shook his head at the thought, as if trying to eject it through his ears. He brought his glass to his lips before realizing it was empty. As he set it back down, he caught the slightest whiff of his own sweat-driven stench. As if not content with the peripheral experience, he lifted his arm and buried his nose into his armpit. Oof, that's ripe. Blake mashed the end button on the phone, figuring his time would be better spent washing the foul odor off himself. He willfully deluded himself with the idea that there would be less of a cue if he called back in a few minutes. He grabbed his phone and headed toward the stairs. He paused, reached into his pocket, pulled out Anya Kohler's business card, and stared at the back of it, at the personal cell phone number she wrote there. He opened his phone and brought up the dialing screen. He stood at the base of the staircase, his intention to quickly grab a shower temporarily forgotten. His thumb hovered over the glowing numbers. He felt his body reacting to the thought of connecting with her again, if only by voice. His pulse quickened and slight perspiration dampened his palms. It was as if he was caught in a mental tractor beam, trying to muster the strength to break free. What the hell is wrong with me? He dropped his hands to his sides and let out an audible sigh. It had been a long time since he was so affected. Dangerous situations, daring escapes, life-threatening injuries. These things had been commonplace for much of his adult life. Through it all, he considered himself a block of ice. But it only took the mere sight of a woman to turn him into a puddle. He pocketed the phone and card and forced himself back on task. Blake retreated to his bedroom, undressed as he walked to the bathroom and turned on the shower. He flicked on a waterproof radio that was fastened to the shower wall by a large suction cup. It was an unwavering part of his routine. The preset talk radio station served to maximize the otherwise mentally idle time by allowing him to catch up on the news of the day. Blake's regimented day was purely of his own making. 
retiring from government work and taking up a job writing code for a mid-sized web development firm, had allowed him the flexibility to work remotely and set his own hours. He was required to attend a video conference development meeting once a week, but was otherwise free to structure his life however he saw fit. And how he saw fit was to abide by a rigid schedule. The voice of Ed Glass, host of the Morning Drive Show, echoed off the hard tile walls. New information coming in at this hour of the hostage situation at IPFG, the radio squawked. I'm being told sources close to one of the released hostages is reporting that several employees may have been injured or killed in the robbery attempt. Blake hopped into the shower and turned up the volume to discern the words over the rushing water. Cynthia Dreyer is on scene. Cynthia, the announcer segued. The strained voice of the reporter cut in, struggling to enunciate over the background noise. I'm standing about a hundred yards from the IPFG building. The whole vicinity has been cordoned off, and we're still seeing a lot of law enforcement personnel arriving. The police were evacuating people from the building about an hour ago, but we haven't seen many more civilians come out for the past thirty minutes. I spoke with several onlookers who reported hearing gunfire coming from inside. According to a relative of one of the released hostages, there may be as many as three civilian casualties. Also, sources say a police tactical team entered the building from the roof and may have shot and killed the five perpetrators. So far, police are not commenting on whether they have taken anyone into custody, but as of yet, no one out here has witnessed anyone being taken out in handcuffs. The good news is the police have announced the threat is over, and there is no danger to the public at this time. While they listened, Blake visualized Ed Glass and Cynthia Dreyer based on physical descriptors he had invented purely inside his mind. He made the mistake once of looking at their actual pictures on the show's website. They looked so unlike the imagined versions, his subconscious simply rejected the real images and opted to use the concocted ones instead. Cynthia, the announcer, chimed in. What do we know about the suspects? Not a whole lot, Ed. Blake switched the radio off and twisted the valve to stop the flow of water. He got dressed and headed down the two flights of stairs toward the bottom level. It was time to go to work, and he was running late. Chapter 6 my office is just down the hall, Reed said as he, Anya, and Harrison stepped off the elevator onto the fourth floor. The hallway was lined with glass panels and doors tightly partitioning off various spaces. Despite the narrowness of the corridor and the overambitious floor plan, the use of glass walls gave the entire floor a bright open feel. As they moved down the corridor, Anya could see Wells in one of the rooms, sitting at a conference table with several other people. Anya knew a couple of them from the bureau, but didn't recognize the others. She considered trying to dart by the room to avoid getting bogged down by her boss, but there was no cover whatsoever, and it was already too late. Oliver Wells motioned to her with his index finger pointed upward as his mouth continued forming words she could not hear through the soundproof partitions. The gesture clearly conveyed that he wanted her to stay exactly where she was until he could finish his conversation. Go ahead and get started, Anya said to Harrison. I'll fill in Wells. Harrison nodded as Reed began leading him further down the corridor. Anya waited while Wells continued to speak with an older man, who Anya estimated to be in his sixties. Anya could not keep from noticing that the man was undeniably attractive for his age. His thick, well-manicured hair and sharp, chiseled nose and chin gave him a strong, distinguished air. His Borioni suit was expertly tailored, and Anya could not detect a single wrinkle in the lush fabric. Wells bobbed his head in a series of exaggerated nods as he stood up from the table. The older man continued speaking to the rest of the group as Wells silently excused himself and moved to the door. Anya tried to read the lips of both men. She discovered this wasn't as easy a proposition as it first seemed. Who was that? Wells asked as he ducked into the corridor, closing the door behind him. And what's he doing up here? One of the IPFG employees. He says he may be able to help us find out if the suspects were able to compromise their systems. Who was that? Anya reciprocated, motioning to the well-dressed man. 
still engaged in an animated one-sided conversation. That Agent Kohler is Jacob Milburn, the president and CEO of IPFG Financial. He came here in person. Why? I mean, doesn't that seem unusual? Wells was already becoming perturbed by Anya's efforts to change the subject and reverse his mini-interrogation back on him. Mr. Milburn has offered resources to assist in the investigation and wanted to check on the well-being of his employees. In person. I'd say that's unusually gracious. Now why don't you and Harrison get on identifying the suspect so we can start giving Mr. Milburn and his team some answers? Anya was not surprised by the redirection. She had become accustomed to Wells hastily doling out obvious or routine tasks, as if they were novel ideas that could only be formulated by a true mastermind. Tasks that could not possibly be delayed a single second longer, for no justifiable reason. Oftentimes he had already assigned the task to another agent, causing one of them to waste hours or even days on the fool's errand. In this case, though, she agreed. Identifying the five subjects had to be her priority, after she finished with Reed. Look, trust me on this. If all of this was carefully planned and executed for the purpose of getting access to a computer terminal, we must know why. If they've infected the computers with some kind of malicious software, there's no time to spare. All right, Kohler. Hurry up. I'll let Milburn know what you're working on and try to buy some time on the IDs, Wells said as he swung open the heavy conference room door. Milburn glanced at Wells and then at Anya. As he did, his eyes locked onto hers. He casually shifted his gaze down and up, as if taking a 3D scan of her dimensions. Moving back to her eyes, a confident smile appeared on his face. Anya felt her face becoming flushed. She purposefully broke eye contact and hurried down the corridor to find Harrison and Reed. With little difficulty, she found them in one of the two corner offices, situated at the end of the main corridor. Harrison was standing behind Reed, looking over his shoulder as the computer engineer rattled away at the keyboard. I did a comparison of the current state against the backup from just before the incident. Anything that was added, deleted, or changed would be readily apparent— but there's nothing suspicious. The only changes I can see are located in system files. Page files, log files, stuff like that. It's exactly as you would expect. The SHA-256 hash values of the automatic backups from before and after the incident match exactly, meaning no pertinent files were compromised. Anya was not exactly sure she could repeat what Reed said verbatim, but she was confident she understood the gist of it. She let Reed continue without interruption. Maybe they were stealing information after all. Good news is, we capture every packet that passes through our routers and save it for 24 hours. I just have to locate the exact time the breach occurred, and I'll be able to inspect the traffic and determine if they sent anything out, Reed explained. Anya joined Harrison, watching the computer screen over Reed's other shoulder as he scrolled through what appeared to be an infinite list of gibberish, as Reed conjured screen after screen of information, Anya's mind momentarily wandered back to a time, many years prior, when Blake would show her lines of computer code and attempt to explain why he was having difficulties solving one problem or another. Inevitably, Blake would have an epiphany, mid-explanation, and thank her for the insight before retreating to his office to finish implementing the solution she inspired. She didn't actually understand any of it. Even in humoring him, she would freely admit that computer code was a foreign language to her. But Blake never seemed to care. He would say the one-sided conversation was just what he needed to approach the problem from a different angle. Rubber ducking, he called it. Anya let out a chuckle, recalling the ridiculousness of the term. Wondering if her slight verbalization had betrayed her inattention, her mind snapped her back to the present. She looked at Harrison and Reed, embarrassed. Despite all that had happened and all that needed to be done, she could not put her ex-boyfriend out of her mind. Seeing him stirred something she had long since suppressed. But she would have to leave that for later. Okay, here it is, Reed said. 
Yep, they definitely sent data out of the building. About 200 gigabytes worth. What does that mean? I mean, is it significant? Do you know what they sent? What they were after? Anya rattled off questions, not waiting for the answers. I don't know. There's no way to know. The connection was encrypted. The data in the packets is unreadable. I can only tell you that it seems like they were after a particular bit of information. Anya tilted her head back in a physical manifestation of mental defeat. She hoped Reed would be able to generate a lead, something that could point her to a possible motive. Is there anything else you can tell us? I can give you the IP address where they transferred the data to, although I doubt it will be much use. There's no way a group like the Evangelists are going to leave a trail, at least not one a cop would be able to trace. Reed shot a skittish smile at the two FBI agents staring blankly back at him. What? I'm just saying. The glass door to the office flew open so forcefully, Anya was sure it would shatter. Jacob Milburn stood in the doorway. Enough, he said sharply. Our CTO and VP of Digital Security are on the way here. I'd appreciate it if you would cease whatever it is you're doing here before you do any more damage. Anya hardly recognized Milburn as the same man she had seen only a couple of minutes earlier. The charming veneer that previously intrigued her had peeled away to reveal a base layer of petulance. She looked to Reed, immediately sorry she put him in an undoubtedly uncomfortable position. Only, Reed did not appear to be uncomfortable. His brow furrowed, slanting his eyebrows toward his nose, his irises pinned to the left in a distant stare, as if he was confused. Wells instantly attempted to placate the man. Mr. Milburn, I apologize. My agents were only trying to— Agent Wells, spare me the apologies. Just keep your employees in check, Milburn snapped. Anya felt her temper boiling up in her throat. The anger was not totally triggered by Milburn's condescending words. It came from the fact that Wells failed once again to have their backs. This is a crime scene, and with all due respect, my agents are authorized by a federal judge and the U.S. Attorney's Office to lock down and search the entire premises, including all digital media. We may allow anyone access to this facility, to whatever extent is deemed necessary, and for however long is required to ensure the integrity of the scene. Now I'll have to ask you to leave the premises, is what he should have said. But Anya knew he would say nothing. Anya noticed Reed's expression changed from one of contemplation to one of epiphany. His eyebrows raised, and his eyes became as large as dinner plates. Mr. Milburn, Reed stuttered. Of course you are. I mean, I'm sorry, sir. I was simply reviewing the network traffic logs. I didn't disturb anything. Actually, I noticed something peculiar you may be interested in. Milburn raised his hand in a casual gesture that had the effect of silencing Reed and everyone else in the room. Do you work for me, Mr... Milburn paused. Reed. Stephen Reed, yes. I'm a senior engineer on the GraphQL team, sir. Well, Mr. Reed, you're fired, Milburn said with no discernible inflection. He turned to the younger man who followed Milburn into the room like he was attached by a short, invisible line. He had black, slicked-back hair and was holding an open leather-covered notebook, as if he were poised to jot down any thought Milburn might spontaneously utter. McGovern. See Mr. Reed out, Milburn directed. The room sank deeper into silence as Milburn turned and walked out of view, leaving McGovern to face the emotionally charged lash-out which would inevitably follow the rash order. But there was none. Reed just sat stunned and speechless. I'm sorry, Mr. Reed. You heard him, McGovern said, squeamishly. Harrison, Kohler, downstairs now, Wells barked, loud enough for Milburn to still hear him. Anya pulled out her business card and placed it on the desk in front of Reed. She placed her hand on Reed's shoulder and said simply, Sorry. Anya and Harrison walked down the corridor and rode the elevator to the ground level without saying a word. As they exited the elevator and walked toward the front of the lobby, Harrison finally spoke. What in the hell was that? he said. 
I have no idea, buddy. Anya's forehead was scrunched into rows of wrinkles by her raised eyebrows. But I'm pretty sure this thing couldn't get any worse. I don't know about that, Agent Kohler, Kame Yamazaki said from about twenty feet away, standing over the body of one of the suspects. There's something you've got to see. Anya had been friends with Yamazaki, even before she started working as a civilian crime scene technician for the FBI. She insisted on calling Anya Agent Kohler while at work, even though Anya repeatedly told her not to. She let it go. Anya and Harrison moved toward Yamazaki. Before the pair even reached her, the spectacle of what lay before them negated any need for Yamazaki to point out her findings. The masks of the five deceased men had been removed. From Anya's vantage point, it appeared to her as though the men did not possess faces at all. Anya stopped five feet from the closest corpse. Without looking at Harrison, she reached to her left and grabbed his forearm, squeezing tightly. Anya's heart raced as she tried to make sense of the disturbing sight. Burned, Yamazaki said. Face, hands, God knows what else. There are no discernible fingerprints, which means there's no way we're going to identify any one of them without a DNA kit. Anya approached and crouched down next to one of the bodies. She examined the mottled, petrified skin that served as a counterfeit face. My God! His nose, lips, ears, all gone. If it weren't for the eyes, you wouldn't even be able to identify this as someone's face. I mean, it doesn't help that the top of his head is missing, but still. What happened to these guys? Anya asked as she recovered from the initial shock. Are we even sure they're males? Harrison asked. Yes. We've confirmed all five are male, Yamazaki answered. Harrison decided not to ask how. Harrison, Anya said, standing. We've got some work to do. Chapter 7 Blake reached the bottom of the stairs and punched a passcode into a keypad on the wall next to a stainless steel door. The mechanism was wholly unlike the consumer-grade deadbolt installed on the front door. This keypad triggered large actuators built into the fortified wall, which slid all the way into the thick metal door. This system was typically used in large vaults, which was essentially Blake's home office. As Blake pushed open the door, the sound of whirling fans escaped. It had been building up by the door and waiting for someone to release it. Blake walked in and sat at his desk. He kept the desktop clear of any clutter, leaving only a keyboard, mouse, and four 5K computer monitors lined up in a slight arc across a large rectangular desk. He pushed the redial button on his phone screen, navigated the prompts by memory, and laid the speaker-enabled phone down on the desk. He listened to a low-fidelity rendition of Brahms while he fired up the beast of a desktop computer and logged in. He had this secure facility built while still working with the agency. He had outfitted it with a state-of-the-art climate control system, air filtration system, and fire suppression system. Inside the room was appointed with some of the best computer equipment money could buy, as well as some that simply could not be bought. Large enclosures, each containing a dozen rack servers, spanned the length of one wall. Two thin enclosures were mounted on an adjacent wall, each housing fifty graphics processing units, connected to a custom motherboard, designed by Blake himself. The GPU's architecture was such that it made them especially good at processing decryption algorithms. Used in parallel, the setup was capable of cracking passwords with ease. Only three other living souls had ever seen the inside of the room after it had been built. Two of them were his former teammates— Fez and Cut. The other was an installer. Blake had recently upgraded to dedicated fiber when it became available in his area. He was reluctant, but the promise of an extreme improvement in internet bandwidth had forced his decision. Although the worker did comment about the sheer amount of equipment in the room, he did not show a deep interest. Blake told him he was running a small internet company. The man seemed to be satisfied enough with that explanation. The capability of his setup was beyond overkill for his new job of writing JavaScript code for web applications. 
The simplistic coding work was enjoyable enough and provided some extra cash flow. But Blake continued to maintain multiple pieces of severely complex classified software, which he originally developed while working for the government. He made a point to continually upgrade his software to take advantage of new advancements in processors and memory, and try to keep up with the ever-changing paradigms of security and cryptology. Of course, Blake regularly provided these updates to his old colleagues as a gesture of camaraderie. Upgrading the software also meant constantly upgrading his equipment to allow him to run and test its functionality against real-world scenarios. Real-world scenarios. This was Blake's softened term for hacking actual live computer systems. He thought it a useful effort to keep his skills sharp, and, by most measures, he had done just that. Since becoming a civilian, he had accessed hundreds of supposedly secure systems— but he prided himself on never causing any damage, downtime, or trace of his presence. Blake was not a criminal, and he despised those who used such skills and technical capability to cheat and steal. While he also was not a vigilante, he certainly didn't mind occasionally giving the so-called black hats a taste of their own medicine. United Bank, how may I help you? A woman said, finally cutting into the elevator music. Hi. My name is Blake Breyer, and I need to check on my account. There's something wrong with my debit and credit cards. Maybe a fraud alert? Your website is down, so I haven't been able to check, Blake explained. Okay. Mr. Breyer, can I have your account number and access code? Blake provided the information and waited for several seconds while the woman loudly clicked the keys of a keyboard. I don't show any such account number. Can you give it to me again? Blake complied reading the numbers verbatim. Sorry, sir. We don't have that account number. Are you sure you called the correct bank? Yes, I'm sure. I've had accounts with you for twenty years. Can you look me up by name? He suggested. Okay. Briar. No, sorry. I don't have any accounts under that name, the woman said in an increasingly condescending tone. Is there anything else I can do for you? Blake considered how to answer the question, but decided most of the options were too harsh for the undeserving messenger. He went with, no, thanks. Blake hung up the phone and leaned back in his chair. He wanted to be able to handle this through the standard channels, like a normal person. But the light from the screens, connected to the massive cluster of computers, radiated on his face as if inviting him in, giving him permission. He had already accessed the United Bank servers once before, as an exercise. Accessing it again would take little effort now that he was familiar with the exploit and had already done the heavy lifting. And it wouldn't hurt to do a little bit of harmless investigation. Blake launched a virtual machine running Kali Linux and accessed a terminal window. He typed in the commands and parameters needed to run the attack. His fingers flew across the keyboard, punctuated by a hard tap of the enter key. He watched the flurry of console output with complete confidence the communication would be untraceable. Thanks to Blake's software, the traffic, encrypted using still classified algorithms, would first pass through the Tor network, obfuscating the origin IP address through a series of proxies. The encrypted packets would then hit an exit node, traverse the regular internet where they would pass through six clandestine data centers, located in various locations around the world. The encrypted payload would be decrypted in six separate stages, ultimately being re-encrypted with a standard scheme before being forwarded to the target. By the time the end point was reached, the origin would be untraceable. The lines of output abruptly stopped, leaving an open SSH prompt. The flashing cursor beckoned him. Commands run at this prompt would be interpreted by the target system itself, as if he were physically sitting at a keyboard in United Bank's data center. Before he could touch the keyboard, the characters VIM appeared one by one at the prompt. The VIM text editor filled the terminal window. Someone was sharing control of his connection. Not possible. 
Blake racked his brain but could not come up with even the faintest beginnings of how this was remotely possible. Even if someone were physically sitting at the computer, logging in to the compromised account would only spawn a new shell. This was something else. A complete hijacking of the same encrypted connection. More characters appeared on the screen. Mr. Briar. The mention of his name made Blake's stomach sink. His senses heightened by a quick injection of adrenaline. His jaw tightened and his eyes narrowed. So, you want to play? Is that it? Who is this? Blake typed, just below the original message. You can call me Bob. The cursor flashed. If you would like. Who is Mr. Briar? This is Randy, Blake wrote, as he brought up another shell and furiously typed commands, trying desperately to glean some information about the methods and origin of the intruder. Please, Mr. Briar, I know more about you than you know about yourself. We only have a few moments. Wouldn't you like your money back? That's why you were here, is it not? My money? Damn it. Could it be that this guy stole my money, erased all record of my twenty-year banking history, hacked an incredibly secure remote connection in a way that isn't even theoretically possible, and now wants me to call him fucking Bob? Yes, Bob. Now that you mention it, I would like it back. Bob. Blake typed out the letters with heavy-handed strokes, trying with all his might to keep his composure. Don't worry. It's safe and sound. All $194,622.15, Bob said, proving his veracity. Why don't we cut through the BS? What do you want, Blake typed. Your help, Bob wrote. Blake stopped splitting his attention between tasks. He had already begun writing a script to deliver a payload to Bob's terminal that he hoped would send enough data back to later analyze and determine the origin of Bob's connection. But he realized he probably would not have anywhere near enough time to execute his plan. And Bob's statement intrigued him. Help with what? Blake typed. The characters slowly appeared, one after another. I. P. F. G. Oh, Lord. Don't tell me this crazy bastard is involved in this IPFG thing. What about it? Blake replied. Please, Mr. Briar, I am out of time. Your skill set and connections are perfectly suited to intervene in this matter. It is important, very important. The FBI, the police, no one realizes what this is really about. You will be contacted. I only ask you to keep an open mind. Blake watched as the characters continued to appear in rapid succession. As for your bank accounts, you will find your funds have been safely transferred here. The typing paused, and then two long strings of characters appeared at once. A Bitcoin address and private key. The cursor jumped to a new line. Bob wrote, it's about Bitcoin. That's what the police and FBI are missing. There are powerful people involved, very resourceful people. Do not underestimate them. The connection terminated, and with it, any reasonable chance of figuring out Bob's identity. Blake immediately opened the Bitcoin blockchain and searched for the address he was given. It was all there. Every penny. Chapter 8 Aaron Hosier wore no expression as he knelt on the cold stone floor, cloaked in a black wool cape and hood. His lack of outward emotion concealed the pride and sense of fulfillment that invisibly oozed from his pores. He had never particularly liked himself, and he fully believed no one would miss him if he were to disappear off the face of the earth. Even kneeling there in anticipation, he could not recall a single moment in his twenty years when he felt content, when he felt like he belonged, until today, the day Aaron Hosier would cease to exist. 
Growing up in Massachusetts, Aaron was always a loner. Like many of his classmates, his parents had been divorced since before he could remember. Raised by a single mother, their lives were not without struggle, but no more so than anyone else he knew. He never complained or wished for wealth, happiness, or success. He was perfectly apathetic. As apathy turned to reclusion, Aaron would spend his days and nights in his room, often lit only by the light emitted from his computer monitor. Out of disconnected curiosity, he would experiment with ways to connect to the outside world anonymously. He joined chat groups and forums where he learned about phishing, cracking, and spoofing. He met coders and hackers who provided him with digital versions of textbooks and manuals. He practiced around the clock and would share his successes with others who he knew only by handle or screen name. His only friends in the world were invisible. And so was he. By the time he was eighteen years old, he was making a modest living by stealing information, generating forged documents, and scamming the unsuspecting masses. In order to operate with anonymity, he used cryptocurrency, not only to receive payment, but also to acquire just about anything he needed. He found the concept to be beautiful, so perfectly simplistic. A growing disdain for the government's transparent efforts to maintain control over its citizens by undermining and vilifying cryptocurrency eventually morphed into an obsession, an obsession that would have unquestionably led to his own destruction, if it had not been for Metis. Aaron began attacking financial institutions and government agencies he believed were working against the decentralization of finance for their own gain. As the attacks became more brazen and the accompanying rhetoric more raucous, Aaron began attracting the attention of the authorities. Unbeknownst to Aaron, the FBI had successfully identified him and obtained approval for an operation that would have led to his arrest and a raid of his home. Metis had intercepted the details of the operation and sent several of his disciples to retrieve Aaron and provide him a safe place to hide from the impending retribution. Aaron was initially skeptical. Indeed, the masked disciples were forced to blindfold, gag, and bind Aaron's hands and feet to carry out the rescue. But it was for his own good. The fragrance of the incense filling the stone room brought back the memory of when he met Metis in person for the first time. He was already familiar with the name. Hell, everyone in Aaron's online circle of cohorts knew the handle. But as far as Aaron knew, no one had ever actually set eyes on him in the flesh. Metis was a legend, an apparition, and as the leader of the most prolific hacktivist group in history, he was to Aaron a hero. Better yet, a god. Aaron had been brought to this room, tied to a chair, and left for hours to listen to the echoes of his own screams for help bounce off the bare stone. The maddening silence was broken by the creaking of a door and the soft steps of his captor approaching him. The man removed his blindfold and spoke softly. Do you know who I am? he asked. Aaron's eyes had adjusted to the darkness of the blindfold. The light of four torches, mounted on the four walls of the room, lit up the scene like the sun. In front of him stood a terrifying sight. The slight, barefooted man, wearing only a pair of loose pants, was hideously deformed. His hairless head and body were marred by reddened scars, contrasting against the pasty white color of the smoother areas of his skin. His nose and ears looked like melted mounds of flesh, but his eyes, peering out from inside the monster, conveyed a peaceful knowingness. Aaron should have been frightened, disgusted at least. Instead, he felt welcomed, and he thought the grotesque figure before him was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. You're Metis, Aaron managed to say. Metis smiled. He freed Aaron from his bindings and sat facing him. Aaron never considered trying to flee or fight. He was mesmerized, as if he really were in the presence of an apparition. The two men talked for hours, 
Metis explained how he had been chosen by God to lead the faithful against the tyranny of greed, why he had chosen the name Metis, and how he had been watching Aaron closely, waiting for the right time to bring him into the fold. He told Aaron of the divine mission of the cryptocurrency evangelist army, and of the plan God had for him. By the end of the long night, Aaron resolved that he would never return to his old life. In the months that followed, Aaron lived and worked with the disciples, each as physically grotesque as their leader. Instead of names, he knew them only by their given numbers. He realized they must have once had names, had lives outside the faith, but could not imagine any of them as individuals. They were devout, they were committed, and they were extremely skilled at cyber mayhem. But most importantly, they were nobody. Now, giving himself over completely to the cause, to the order, to God. He was not convinced that Metis was merely a prophet, as the disciples believed him to be. Aaron truly believed he was an angel. A group of faceless figures, clad in the same heavy cloaks, filed into the room and encircled him. The low, melodic chanting of the group was intoxicating. A tingle traveled around Aaron's scalp and down his spine, causing his body to shiver. Then he heard the voice of an angel. God has spoken to me, my son, Metis bellowed. In his eyes, you have proven yourself worthy. Do you now denounce your name and give yourself unconditionally to the Lord? I do, Aaron replied. And do you swear undying loyalty to your brethren, the cause, and to me, as the hand of God's will, Metis continued. Yes, I do, he said. And do you understand the penalty for disloyalty and treachery, as commanded to me by God, is death? I understand, Aaron replied. Then it shall be done, Metis finished. He motioned to the group surrounding Aaron. Eight disciples closed in upon Aaron Hosier, pulling the cloak from his shoulders and exposing his bare torso. One of the disciples guided Aaron backwards until he laid flat on his back, arms outstretched to the sides. Four of the disciples straddled him, one on each leg and one on each arm, pinning him to the ground. A fifth held the back of his head. Metis approached, leaned down, and with his thumb drew the sign of the cross on Aaron's forehead. Aaron's eyes were as wide as saucers as he watched his prophet and savior spark the propane torch. Blue and yellow flames raged from the metal nozzle. Aaron's body began to shake and his arms and legs instinctively tried to retract. The weight of the five men prevented him from moving more than a few inches in any direction. As Metis drew the flame toward Aaron, he proclaimed, Aaron Hosier is dead. Born from fire is a soldier. Number one, three. Wait, was the last word soldier thirteen would utter, before his ability to form words was swallowed by primal screams. <laughs>